Another near midair involving a military aircraft and a civilian commercial airliner takes place down in the Caribbean. How close was this one? Let's listen in. First, I'll jump with 1112. Another 1112, go ahead. Sir, I, we just had traffic pass directly in front of us within five miles of us, uh, maybe two, three miles, but it was an uh, air to air refueler from the United States airport. And he was at our altitude. We we had to uh, stop our climb. Okay. So JetBlue 1112 is coming out of Caracau, uh, down in the Caribbean. That is uh, an airport that they frequent quite often. You Beautiful blue skies down there, beautiful blue seas. Uh, it's it's kind of the philosophy of big sky, little airplane, right? And they're being tracked along. But as you know, there's issues going on now with Venezuela, which is not far away. So the expectation is eh, there's probably going to be some military aircraft around. Uh, but it's very unusual to run into one that's unannounced. In other words, you're climbing up to your altitude. They've been cleared to flight level 350. They're going to encounter this military aircraft. Why do they not know it's there? Well, I'll explain in a minute. Let's listen in. The traffic was at your altitude. They're heading off to the northeast right now. They passed directly uh, in our flight path. Uh, we had to stop our climb. They are not painting. They, they don't have their transponder turned on. Uh, it's outrageous okay it's outrageous is his conclusion uh now he says they're not painting what does that mean that means that they don't have their transponder turned on that's not out of the question for military aircraft especially if they're in the middle of a mission or doing operations to turn their transponder off this is an aerial refueler in order to refuel with the smaller airplanes that come up and take a drink from this refueler they're going to have to turn their transponder off and so is the other aircraft why because when they get close to each other the TCAS is just going to keep going off all right so they turn it off in order to do the refueling everybody knows where everybody else is you can see the other aircraft however that also means that commercial jets can't see you. Now, at first, he said they were five miles away. And then he said, well, maybe more like two or three. I'm here to tell you that two or three miles at that speed is like in an instant. You can make up that two to three miles within a few seconds. So it's pretty close. And as they were climbing up, you know, the, the aerial refuelers up here, they're climbing up into his altitude. And as you see in your windscreen, and they, they're going to say in a minute here, he was at 10 o'clock. He's coming left to right in front of them. So they're going to climb right into this guy. The key is if you have constant bearing and decreasing range, if you have constant bearing and decreasing range, you're going to collide with other aircraft. So when they get that sense, the pilots do, they lower the nose of the aircraft. They even descend a little bit to get out of the way. They're kind of flustered at this point. You know, the word outrageous is uh, not used very often in uh, aviation, uh, but they're very upset that they didn't know that this guy was out there. I've had situations similar to this back in the day in the military. I'll explain that situation in a minute, but let's continue on with these guys. Yes, I don't have anything on my screen. It has been outrageous with the unidentified aircraft within our airspace. You are totally right, sir. Okay, this guy is very sympathetic. He says, it's outrageous. You are totally right, sir. He's got that kind of Caribbean laid-back sound to his voice. Uh, and uh, JetBlue is uh, pretty upset. Now, they've continued their climb up to 35,000 feet now that they're clear of the, the traffic. But, yeah, that, that's, again, it'll get your attention. Well, I apologize. Uh, that uh, if you can make a note of it, um, we almost had a mid-air collision up here. Almost had a mid-air collision up here. It was that close, and uh, they didn't pass within feet of each other. But miles is too close anyway, uh, especially the size of those aircraft. And imagine the explosion it would make if you hit an aerial refueler. It's just not even you don't even want to think about it. We will make a note. All right, but there's more to come here. Hang in there. We'll be right back, but first, a quick word from our sponsor. Look, turbulence can be unsettling, even when you fly all the time like I do. Those sudden drops, they can make anyone jump. And as we just saw on this Delta flight, turbulence isn't just uncomfortable, it can seriously injure people who aren't seated or strapped in. The reality is turbulence is normal, it's expected. But that doesn't mean the anxiety magically goes away. 
A lot of fear comes from not knowing what's happening or what's coming next. That's why I want to tell you about a resource I personally use, Turbulence Forecast. These folks have built an amazing service that gives you real-time turbulence maps, detailed route forecasts, and intel based on the same kind of pilot reports we look at in the cockpit. So instead of worrying about every bump, you can see the big picture before you even step on board. Here's what I recommend you try. Enter your flight number, see where turbulence is likely along your exact route, learn why you might hit a rough spot, and where it smooths out again. Because when you understand what to expect, you're more confident. And confidence, that's the best tool for staying calm in the air. So whether you're flying tomorrow or planning your next trip, download Turbulence Forecast today to plan for the flight ahead. You'll feel more in control, you'll enjoy the ride a whole lot more, and hey, turbulence happens, but being prepared makes all the difference. And thanks to Turbulence Forecast for sponsoring today's video. Sponsors like this help us to make more content for you. They're heading off into Venezuelan airspace, if that helps, but they're going off to the northeast. Uh, they, I'll give you some uh, distance here from uh, uh, the VOR. So he's going to try to help this controller identify this guy. He might be able to get what's called a primary target on him. He's kind of a long ways out, so it's hard to, the farther away from the, the actual radar itself, the harder it is to paint a primary target. A primary target is just a hunk of metal in the sky that the radar goes out, sends a signal, it comes back and it says something's out there. We don't know what it is. We don't know how fast it's going. We might not even know what altitude it's at, but it's out there someplace. So take a look and they'll say one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, take a look outside. Uh, they don't even see that. And this guy obviously is not electronically communicating with them through the TCAS system or the transponder system. And so he's just kind of heading out into Venezuelan airspace. I totally get it. This uh, aerial refueler may never even have seen this jet blue flight. Depends on his perspective. The jet blue flight might have been slightly behind him and to the right. He probably didn't even see him, but there's more to come. All right, they're at 340. Just uh, going happily along. <laughs> going happily along. <laughs> they never even saw us, right? That's a great way to put it. I, it looks like a about the 015 radio uh, off of um, Curacao 150 uh, CME. Okay, so what does that mean to you and me? All right, so let's say this is the 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 Curacao VOR right here. It's a little transmitter on the ground. It's fixed in, in, in space. It never moves. And it's transmitting 360 degrees around it all the time. And so each one of those degrees is called a radial. So he says it's off the 015 radial. So let's say this is 360. Let's say this is north between you and me. 015 is going to be about 15 degrees this way. And then he said, I think it's like 150 DME or something. So 150 miles out that 015 radial, that's about where we saw this aircraft. So now the guy back in the approach controller can now say, okay, right in this vicinity out here, he can map it out. It's basic geometry is that aircraft. And now if he's got a course and a speed of that aircraft, he can kind of map out where that guy's going to go. Is he coming back into my airspace? Is he going into somebody else's airspace? Is he going to be a headache for me in the future? Do I need to call that traffic? And for how long do I need to tell other aircraft that there's a potential conflict out here at 34,000 feet? Very helpful information from JetBlue at this point. These guys are, are on top of it. So Curacao wants more? Go ahead, sir. Just to complete the traffic cross in front of you at level 3401. That traffic looks like they were level at 340. We're passing through 33.3, uh, 33.4, 33 somewhere in that range would be quantum uh, at maybe the 10 o'clock position, but uh, they were moving directly in front of us at 34, and we were climbing to 35. So. Uh, we had to stop our climb and actually uh, descend to avoid hitting them. Okay, so he gives us all the details now. So let's say this is 12 o'clock again, you and me, 12 o'clock. He says they were at 10 o'clock, so it would be 10 o'clock on the clock. Out here, they're at 34,000 feet, we're at 33,400 coming up into him. If he's headed this way and we're headed this way, we're going to run right into that guy. It's a good thing they saw him. Had he been a little bit behind them and they not seen him out the left side, they might have had a mid-air collision. Once they get up to that same altitude, that 
one or two or three mile distance, it gets eaten up just like that. Boom, just like that real quick. So he's given this guy now, the air traffic controller, all the details so he can now chart out where this guy is headed so he can warn other aircraft. Right. We'll do a report on RM2, but the, uh, they, they, they did not have the transponder turned on, so there's no way for you to have seen them. Yes, please make your report. So at least in that case, you can get the authorities to be investigated. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Now he says, you know, the, you know, do your report on your end, get the authorities to investigate this. This this is not something to be investigated, especially if the military is down there operating. It's an unfortunate thing. Um, one of the first things you'll learn as a very, very junior pilot is keep your head on a swivel, all right? And that means when you're in the cockpit, you know, heads up, you're always looking outside for something. And these JetBlue pilots, they're all over it, right? They're out there looking around. And when they see that great big aircraft, they're like, whoa. And then they take evasive measures. That's great. All right. So after JetBlue um, continued to their destination uh, and landed, uh, everybody landed safely. Uh, no problems. They were on their way up to JFK. Um, and they got there. This was the only event in this flight, fortunately for them. Uh, we don't know where the aerial refueler ended up, but there's lots of excitement going down in the Caribbean these days. Uh, and there's going to be more of this sort of thing down there. So I'd say to my Caribbean piloting friends, keep your head on a swivel. Listen up on the radio. Don't depend on that T-cast, the fish finder, as we call it, to bail you out. Keep your head on a swivel. Be looking out of the cockpit. And, you know, as we always say, have fun, right, at the same time. But uh, these guys did a great job saving the day. Uh, everybody in the back, they didn't even know what they're sipping their Diet Cokes. And uh, maybe they had a little bit of nose over and then they came right back up and it was a big nothing burger at the end of it. But man, whew, sometimes it can get just that close. All right. Well, now you know. I'm Captain Steve. Fly safe. There have been some other near mid-airs. You might want to check one of them out here or, well, here. <laughs>